it's my great pleasure to welcome Yanis Mamouras here um, to, for, for this afternoon's um, PEFM and CSOX talk. Um, Yanis uh, has an undergraduate degree from the London School of Economics and his PhD from the University of London. He's a professor at the um, University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki. Um, and has published very widely in a range of issues, including monetary policy in the European periphery, and so is a great monetary expert. He's also been Deputy Finance Minister in Greece and Chief Advisor and Head of the Policy Committee of the Greek Prime Minister, and he's at present Deputy Governor of the Bank of Greece, so clearly centre of, knows the centre and the periphery of the EU, and very privileged to be able to... Yeah, so you're going to talk, you said, for about 50 minutes, yeah, and sorry, then that yeah, gives us roughly, similar yeah. time for questions and answers. Yeah, there's one correction. My first degree is from Greece, from the Aristotelian University of Saloniki. My MSc is from the MSc. MSc is from the yeah. MSc. Okay, even better. So, thank you, Charles, for your kind introductory remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to thank the European Institute of St. Anthony's College and the Political Economy and Financial Markets Programme for the invitation. It is a great honour for me to be here at prestigious Oxford University, the most renowned university in the world. <laughs> my lecture... My, <laughs> by far, by far. Since you like it, I will not by far. <laughs> my lecture this afternoon is about the state of play on the most important aspects of the ECB's monetary policy. My analysis will be in, the, in terms of targets and instruments of ECB's monetary policy. I'll try to offer my own insights more as an ECB watcher rather than as an ECB insider. This allows me to make constructive comments in public and to offer also my educated guesses to such a distinguished audience. Clearly, the usual disclaimer applies. That is, the views expressed here are my personal views, neither the ECB's nor the Bank of Greece's. That will be the first part of my lecture. In the second part, my focus will be on the way forward for the monetary policy, with emphasis on the so-called exit strategies from unconventional monetary policies within the framework of a global monetary policy outlook and divergent central bank policies. So here is the agenda. Let me start with this novel, but quite old by now, monetary policy regime, the so-called inflation targeting. Inflation targeting as a monetary policy framework was designed to bring and maintain inflation down. In this respect, central banks have been exceptionally successful. Compared to the 70s and 80s, average inflation in the US, the euro area, and the host of other industrialized countries over the period 92 to 2007 declined from double-digit levels to values very close to 2%. Inflation rates not only became lower, they also became less volatile and much less persistent. This allowed firms and households to upgrade their long-term planning capacity, a cornerstone underpinning the higher growth rates observed during the so-called Great Moderation Era. Over the last eight years, the challenge is to pull inflation up, though. Central banks have responded by using standard and non-standard monetary policy measures including negative interest rates and the introduction of credit and quantitative easing programs, extended significantly their balance sheets. Recent empirical evidence that we will examine below suggests that these measures have been successful in preventing larger and more prolonged recessions that have contributed to God's restoring increasingly positive growth rates. The Great Recession triggered by the global financial crisis of 2008 change drastically the environment under which inflation targeting is being applied. From a policy-making perspective, the biggest challenge is probably not the downward impact effect of the financial crisis has had on demand and with a short time lag on inflation rates, even though this has been very pronounced. What is more challenging is the persistence of these effects. Starting from 2008, the output gap in all major economies remains negative while average inflation rates have been well below the 2% threshold. This is where the, inflation, the average inflation is down and output gaps really are on the upper trend. Before looking into the state of affairs in the euro area, 
a more general question may be in order. General in the sense that it is valid not only in the Euro area, but also to all advanced economies, including the United Kingdom, in the era of globalization. Question. What are the determinants of low and persistent deflation today? Firstly, demographic changes, as average lifetimes have been increasing. In the G7 area, household savings rates since 2007 have increased in the US, Canada, albeit from very low levels. They remain constant in Germany and France, admittedly at high levels, declined in Italy and Japan, and followed an inverse V shape in the United Kingdom. Secondly, supply shocks. Wage growth has generally been compressed either due to increased unemployment restricting the bargaining power of trade unions or lower inflation expectations embedded in the wage setting process, as in the case of Germany, the infamous agreement between employers and trade unions for the freezing of wages for a prolonged period. Overall, declining unit labor costs combined with low energy prices, global disinflation and an increase in competitive conditions provide evidence of positive supply shocks. These supply side effects, however, are unlikely to be the primary cause of observed low inflation. If they were, we should not be observing substantial output gaps that we saw a minute earlier. Unavoidably, therefore, the conclusion must be that the primary cause of persistently low inflation is a drop in demand over the past few years, making low inflation the symptom rather than the cause of nominal demand, of low nominal demand, an issue which I'll come back later on in section four of my speech. Of course, there, there is no shortage of suspects in inverted commas causing this effect. The sudden stop in firms banking finance during the Great Recession and in the context of EMU, the resulting European sovereign debt crisis and internal devaluations in the Euro periphery, the tightening of fiscal policy following the costly bank bailout programs undertaken by sovereigns, and lower short-term inflation expectations causing further wage moderation. President Draghi has summarized the evidence briefly and eloquently. I quote from him, Low interest rates in Western countries are not the problem. They are the symptom of an underlying problem, which is insufficient invested demand across the world to absorb all the savings available in the global economy. I move now to the second section of how unconventional monetary policies have been used to cure low inflation in the euro area. My focus is on negative rates and the so-called QE, the quantitative easing. I will start by a brief exposition of the theory underpinning unconventional monetary policy measures. Move on to review the empirical evidence regarding their effectiveness, placing my focus upon the euro area, and finally discuss their potential adverse side effects. Some theory first. Negative interest rates historically have been an extremely rare phenomenon. Even during the Great Depression in the US, short-term nominal rates were never negative, while during the Great Recession only the one-month and three-month US Treasury bills <coughs> rates fell below zero in 2008. Nevertheless, the prolonged negative output gaps observed in recent years eventually put some central banks into such uncharted waters. Negative rates were first introduced in Sweden in 2009 and have since been adopted by a number of central banks in Europe and beyond. This includes the central banks of Denmark, Switzerland, the ECB, and finally the Bank of Japan since January 2016. At the same time, the majority of the world's central banks introduced major quantitative easing programs, significantly expanding their balance sheets as percentage of GDP. Stands from 10% up to almost 100% for the Swiss National Bank. A negative interest rate policy reduces borrowing costs for companies and households, driving demand for loans up and incentivizing investment and consumer spending affecting the outlook for the economy, also through increasing confidence. By discouraging capital inflows, 
there will be downward pressure on the exchange rate supporting external demand. On the other hand, QE, quantitative easing, works through four channels of transmission. First is the credit channel, namely the effect upon private lending. Second is the interest rate channel. This involves lower long-term interest rates to improve investment conditions and incentivize savings. Third, the portfolio rebalancing channel. This operates through the purchase of relatively low risk assets of long-term maturity. And finally, the exchange rate channel boosting demand for net exports. Another key pillar of monetary policy introduced lately, at least at the European level, is forward guidance, which is far from a non-standard tool, unlike QE. The ECB communicates explicitly its expectations to the markets. In doing so, it is able to influence market views of future interest rates in the euro area. The ECB's forward guidance today states that inverted commas, interest rates will remain at present or lower levels for an extended period of time. Before coming to the evidence, first let me begin with a brief look into the current euro area economic outlook. The euro area's macroeconomic framework contains the following elements. Internal devaluation in some distressed peripheral countries. Fiscal devaluation in other countries. This is shifts in taxes away from labor towards indirect taxes. And fiscal consolidation accompanied by private debt deleveraging across the monetary union together with an ultra-loose monetary policy. Not surprisingly then, the result is anemic growth and low nominal demand and very low inflation. Let me give you some details on the Eurozone's current outlook. Inflation has been persistently below the ECB's 2% objective since January 2013, below 1% for two years and below half percentage point for 18 consecutive months. The flash estimate for euro area annual headline inflation in January last month is 1.8%, 0.7 percentage points higher than the December final estimate. However, most of the increase in is headline inflation <coughs> coming from energy prices. Core inflation in the flash estimate remains subdued at 0.9%, the same as in last December. Real GDP grew by 1.7% in the euro area over the whole of 2016 and is expected to remain unchanged, unchanged this year. The unemployment rate fell to 9.6% in December, its lowest rate since May 2009, but still doubled the US rate, which stands at 4.7%. Finally, regarding the ECB interest rates, the ECB deposit facility rate has been in negative territory since June 2014 and has remained at minus 0.4 since March 2016. On the same day, the ECB further reduced its fixed rate on MROs at 0% and the marginal lending facility rate at 0.25%. These are the two the overnight interest rates set by the ECB. There is no doubt that given the problem of a persistently low inflation, the euro area definitely needs accommodative monetary policy. Inflation has been and always will be a monetary phenomenon. We can agree and disagree on this. So combating low inflation requires monetary policy. In technical terms, this means QE, credit easing, and even negative nominal rates. According to the latest empirical evidence that I'll show to you in a minute, from a number of indicators, the conclusion is that the policy works slowly but steadily. So, turning now to the evidence on negative rates and QE, just to remind you the numbers, for the time being, the Euro system has already purchased 1.6 trillion. It's a very, very big, big number. 1.6 trillion of assets under the so-called expanded asset purchase program. This includes 1.3 trillion under the public sector purchase program, the so-called QE that I mentioned earlier, and still has to buy another 660 billion of assets until the end of 2017. So the question that will come sooner or later will be what the ECB is going to do all these assets. It's the exit strategy that I mentioned in the introduction that I'm going to refer to later on.
Another non-standard tool of ECB monetary policy are the so-called long-term refinancing operations, commonly known as LTROs. These are three-period loans at a very cheap rate given to commercial banks and other credit institutions in the euro area, and more so-called targeted LTROs where the period is even four or five years, but at a very cheap rate even zero or even negative. It is true that there is some encourage, encouraging evidence from QE, mainly from the M3 growth rate and the banking sector, such as the growth rate of loans. So clearly M3 has gone up, it's nearly 5%. The annual growth rate of loans to households and firms, uh, non-financial corpor uh, corporations again is high, so clearly you have more liquidity at the euro area at a lower cost. The bank lending rates are quite lower as a result of this ECB's policies. More importantly, I come from the periphery of the euro area. The cross-country heterogeneity in bank lending rates has declined further, for example, since the announcement of the ECB's credit easing measures in June 2014, the average cost of borrowing for euro area non-financial corporations has fallen by around 111 basis points and by 151 basis points and 180, 180 basis points for firms in Spain and Italy respectively. In addition, in addition since the launch of the QE program in March, the euro depreciated against the dollar by 6%, depreciated by 25% in the last two and a half years. Moreover, the purchase programs have also greatly contributed to a significant decline in sovereign yields. A compression of intra-euro area spreads and the flattening of yield curves across all markets that were only partially offset by bond market correction that began in early May. It's about the, the parity and the two-year yield. The developments described above are, of course, welcome. However, they have not delivered today the required increase in average EMU inflation. Monetary policy, of course, one might say, involves long and variable lags. So the full effect of QE and negative interest rate policy may have not yet been delivered. The other side of the argument, however, says that the introduction of both policies, negative rates and QE, is now more than two years old. So somebody would say it was time to deliver. This together with the fact that Eurozone inflation expectations, as measured by the five-year survey-based inflation from concession economics and the inflation linked swaps, has declined markedly in 2016, and this is a source of caution, if not of concern. There are, of course, risks with these unconventional monetary policies. I'll be brief about the risks, starting with common risks, meaning risks common to both negative rates and QE. First, of course, is excessive risk-taking, raising concerns about financial stability. Indeed, the volume of high-yield, non-investor-grade bonds and leveraged loans issued during the past four years totals about $3.5 trillion, compared with $1.3 trillion in subprime mortgage loans that were outstanding in 2007. Existing micro-evidence suggests that decreases in overnight interest rates does spare greater risk-taking by lower capitalized banks and greater liquidity risk exposure. A second concern relates to disincentives provided to governments, especially from the euro periphery, where you have negative rates and you have QE, then you do less reforms. You are inclined to do less reforms because monetary policy is doing the job for you. Risks now mainly related to negative interest rates. First and foremost is bank profitability. According to a recent ECB report, 81% of the euro area banks have experienced a decline in net interest income over the last year. 
In the same period, 27% of the banks indicated a lower margin on loans to enterprises. 21% of the banks have experienced a lower margin on consumer credits and other lending to, to households. A recent research by the BIS shows the following. The main sources of operating income for banks in the euro area are approximately 60% 60 from net interest income, 25% from fees and commissions, and 15% from other income sources. So clearly, net interest income and the drop of it is really important for bank profitability. Apart from this, there are also negative effects on financial markets, money market funds, insurers and pension funds, which may find themselves unable to meet fixed long-term obligations due to negative rates. Life insurance companies will also be less able to meet guarantee returns. Finally, risks mainly related to QE, quantitative easing. The main risk, of course, from an extended period of QE is the issue of scarcity, namely a reduction in the availability of safe assets that provide important services such as collateral to banks or institutional investors which have to hold these high-quality liquid assets to comply with regulatory requirements. Because QE removes a fraction of the safe assets from the financial system, QE may be detrimental to market functioning, severely distorting capital markets. In other words, price discovery would be compromised and liquidity premiums would increase. One word about the so-called emergency liquidity assistance, which is very important, is of paramount importance for my own country, Greece. As the financial crisis intensified, the supply of liquidity in the interbank market in stressed countries, Greece, Ireland, Cyprus, especially during the sovereign debt crisis between 2011 and 2013, banks short of eligible collateral for the standard monetary policy operations have to move to the so-called ELA, Emergency Liquidity Assistance, paying higher rates at the penalty rate, even 150 basis points, for the liquidity offered by the National Central Bank. I do this every afternoon at the Bank of Greece, write checks for our commercial banks. As distinct from the Eurosystem's credit operations, national central banks can temporarily provide emergency liquidity assistance to euro area credit institutions which are solvent but face liquidity problems. ELA, therefore, is a national monetary policy instrument under the ECB supervision. ELA has been proved an increasingly important device used in the Eurozone to maintain liquidity during times of financial distress. Put some figures there to show you. This is for Cyprus, but also you see that Belgium made use of it. And the table there, where you can see that in Belgium, the emerging liquidity systems reached a figure of 51 billion. In Germany, in Germany, 31 bi 38 billion, beg your pardon. In Ireland, 68 billion. Portugal, 3.5. Cyprus, 9.6. And Greece, in two periods one when we came very close to bankruptcy, when the number really was skyrocketing number, 123 billion in August 2011, and also in February 2015, that reached 90 billion, it's about 50 billion today. In the United Kingdom, also the Bank of England gave emergency liquidity assistance because the case in October 2008 for the Royal Bank of Scotland and later on for the Halifax and the Bank of, Scro Bank of Scotland, total sum of 61 billion sterling pounds. Before coming to the way forward, because lots of my area research as an academic had to do with central bank independence charts, mm -hmm. so I went back to this after 25 years and I have a comment or two to make on this concept of central bank independence. The question is how this very much uh, concept of independence has been affected, if at all, through this unconventional monetary policy. There are two challenges regarding the concept of independence in this era of unconventional monetary policy. First, the independence of central bank instruments has been put into question by external parties. I'll give you some concrete examples here. 
U.S. President-elect Donald Trump criticized Fed Chair Janet Yellen for the Fed's policy of low interest rates. In this great country, British Prime Minister Theresa May came openly against the Bank of England's policy at the Governor McCartney, saying that low interest rates deprive savers from interest income. In Germany, the so-called Five Wise Men, Wise Men and German Finance Minister Dr. Schäuble criticized ECB President Mario Draghi for his negative interest rate policy. Second challenge is the following. Even if the instrument's independence is not formally challenged, it may be effectively compromised as a result of the altered conditions. My own verdict, I want to be brief on this very important topic, after revisiting the topic of central bank independence, this time with the Eurozone central bank is hot, is that any challenge should not be in the very concept of independence, but rather in the current economic policy mix. Ultra loose monetary policy plus tight fiscal policy. Monetary policy obviously interacts with other policies, namely fiscal, structural, and financial. Separate authorities charged with the conduct of these policies may be formally independent, they are, however, also interdependent. The risk raised by such interdependence is that if one independent policy authority does not take appropriate action to meet its mandate objectives, the remaining independent authorities may be obliged to overreact in a persistent manner in order to meet their own objectives. To provide an example, a direct way of identifying such a policy that depends failure is in the field of nominal demand. For instance, in the Eurozone, nominal demand in QT, Q2 2016 was only 7% higher than in Q2 2008, but much lower than the potential increase in its trend rate, roughly at 24%. Compare this European number 7% with the one for the US 23% of nominal demand growth during the same period. In brief, this may result in a regime of weak dominance of other policies over monetary policy, effectively destabilizing the regime of monetary dominance that central bank independence is meant to establish. The independence of central banks may be scrutinized due to concerns as to whether a central bank with an extended mandate of objectives can operate transparently and with a, an appropriate degree of accountability in the context of a democratic political system. All in all, an independent central bank that is subject to checks and balances and to democratic accountability needs broader support from the public. Clearly, with persistent negative rates, one is sooner or later bound to lose major parts of the broad constituency needed by independent central bankers. Before coming now to my final topic on exit strategies, perhaps the most hotly discussed issue in monetary policy today, let me offer briefly my own insights on the global policy outlook because monetary policies of G4 major central banks are communicating vessels. 2017 will be very different from 2016 in many respects. If 2016 will be remembered as the year of Brexit, of course, and the year where Donald Trump was elected, 2017, I foresee, may well be remembered for developments in the European continent. I refer to the national elections and the associated political uncertainty that may trigger further changes in the Eurozone and the broader European Union as we know it today. Two other key topics will be the new U.S. economic policy under President Trump and the end of the dominance of central banks which will pass the torch to fiscal policy across the globe. So-called Trabonomics will remain an important market influence this year with investors particularly interested in two things. The transition from announcements to detailed design and sustain implementation and outcomes particularly when it comes to the mix between higher growth and deflation. The anticipation of a more active fiscal policy is based on the assumption that President Trump will reinvent the package of policies known as Reaganomics in the early 1980s, which resulted then in a seriously overvalued dollar. 
On the external front, of course, there is the question of foreign policy, both in terms of trade and geopolitical issues. There is a heightened risk on trade protectionism under the Trump administration for several Asian economies, as well Canada and Mexico, with strong trade ties to the U.S., including the emerging markets, other emerging markets, open borders and free trade agreements are of paramount importance. A word about Europe's politics. Political risks to the European order are on the rise after the UK vote to leave the EU and the unprecedented wave of migration from war-torn countries in the Middle East and North Africa that has fueled the rise of national politics and populism and the backlash against mainstream politicians and political and financial elites. Euroscepticism is now a strong sediment in Europe. Populist parties are in government or in a ruling coalition in nine countries of the EU. This is an alarming figure. Elections this year in the Netherlands, France, Germany and maybe Italy, four of the founding members of the European Economic Community back in the 1950s, 57, 60 years since then, are critical as they may provide gains to populist parties that would result in increased Euroscepticism across Europe and as political risks seem to come ahead of economics. Few words on the G4 divergent monetary policies, starting with the Fed. At present, markets are priced for only two rate increases this year, one in the end of the first half of 2017 and another by the end of the year. The Fed probably will not add its gradual monetary normalization plans until there is more clarity, more direction about the profile of US fiscal policy. The so-called monetary policy divergence among G4 central banks will remain a key theme in the first half of this year, while for the second half of the year, less monetary policy divergence between G4 central banks will most probably be on the cards. Briefly about the Bank of Japan and then the Bank of England. As you probably know, since last September, the Bank of Japan introduced a new monetary policy framework, best known as QQE, with yield curve control, and shifted its key policy target from quantity, namely asset purchases, to interest rates, thus preparing the ground for its own QE tapering. While inflation is likely to remain much lower than the Bank of Japan's 2% inflation target in coming years, 0.6 is the forecast for this year, it is not expected by the markets any more monetary easing during Governor Kuroda's term. Regarding the Bank of England, although spot inflation will likely move higher over the coming year, will rise to 2.7% in 2017, according to the Bank of England's forecasts, the bank has clearly stated that its stance now is neutral. However, there are enhanced concerns over the impact of Brexit referendum on growth, together with the potential shock to real incomes expected as price pressure begins to build over Q1. At present, the market prices a 35% chance of a quarter rise to the bank rate by the end of this year. Table 5, I show this divergent monetary policies for G4. Finally, one word about the prospects of financial markets this year. This is hosted under the <laughs> political economy financial market groups. And I draw these remarks from my responsibility as chair of the Financial Asset Management Committee at the Central Bank of Greece, which supervises our investor portfolio of several billions of euros. So our forecasts at the bank are the following. In the FX markets, we remain bullish for the US dollar, mainly as a result of Trump's economic policies. We remain bearish on sterling pound, mainly because we forecast that the Brexit risk will overshadow everything else. In the sovereign bond markets, our prediction at the bank is more than usual volatility, higher term premium, especially on the long end of the yield curve, namely steepening yield curves, and an increase in the spread between the core and peripheral yields in the Eurozone. This is now the last section of my speech, which is on exit strategies. <coughs> if, as Charles correctly pointed out to me, will ever happen. <laughs> Let's see. 
Following last December's Governing Council meeting in Frankfurt, where the ECB announced a slowdown in the pace of asset purchases from 80 billion monthly down to 60 billion euros, many analysts have interpreted this move as a rather hawkish tilt in the ECB's reaction faction, a signal, in other words, towards an earlier than later proper tapering and or B, interest rate normalization. That decision then by the ECB was motivated partly by concerns about scarcity. It was also influenced by some discomfort with a very accommodative monetary stance, too low for too long, and the influence that has had on structural reform process. In addition, there are also macro considerations. <coughs> Although core inflation remains below 1%, economic growth has been running at well above potential pace for a while now, and the unemployment rate has been falling fairly briskly. This has dramatically reduced deflation risk in the region. If this is the case, if, the next interesting question is the following. When such a proper tapering and or first rate hike to take place in the euro area? Opinions differ on this bone of contention, obviously, at the very top level. I have two quotes here. One is from President Draghi. Can we go? Yeah. The, the top yeah, the top is from President Draghi. And the second one is from Sabine Laundeschleger, is the ECB is a member of the ECB Executive Board, the Vice Chair of the SSM at the ECB and of German nationality, of course. So President Draghi, when asked, he said not yet. But the ECB executive member said, well, perhaps it, it's time now to do this. So what I have to say on this very important issue is the following, and I choose my words carefully. Exit timing is a hard question indeed. Monetary policy is well known, is a mix of science and art. Forecasting interest rate decisions and changes in balance sheets is a difficult task in general all the more so when this is equivalent to a regime switch, especially, of course, given the heightened uncertainty in the world economy and the skewed risk to the downside surrounding the global growth outlook. Shrinking the balance sheet instead of raising short-term rates could be a way to tie in financial conditions without bearing the cost of a stronger euro. Policies of quantitative tightening now could well moderate any increase in the policy rate. Speaking in my professorial capacity and leaving aside for a moment my central banker's hat to avoid any misunderstanding, I could try to provide a tentative answer, an indication if you like, to the above hard question on the first, the first ECB rate hike. I use the famous Taylor rule which says the following. It's that simple question there, just to name the symbols there. I is the nominal interest rate. I star is the equilibrium nominal interest rate. I'm going to explain in a minute what is I star means. Pi is the core inflation, could be actual inflation there if you like. Pi star is the target rate of inflation, 2% at the euro zone case. U is the unemployment rate and UN is the so-called natural rate of unemployment. The Taylor rule can be expressed in many different variants. The original was in terms of growth rates and potential growth. This can easily be transformed in terms of unemployment. You can see it more easily. <coughs> it states the following, essentially, the Taylor rule. rule. Firstly, it suggests that under normal circumstances, when the economy is at full employment and price stability, the policy rate should align with the equilibrium neutral rate, this I star, defined as the interest rate that sustains the economy at full employment and price stability once these conditions have been reached. Secondly, the policy rate, I, on the left-hand side, should only deviate from the equilibrium neutral rate, I star, to the extent that unemployment deviates from the natural rate of unemployment and deflation deviates from the central bank's inflation objective, pi star. And finally, monetary policy should evolve as the macroeconomy evolves so that when full employment and price stability are reached, the policy rate is aligned with the equilibrium neutral rate. This is to reflect the lags between changes in monetary policy and their impact on the real economy and deflation. So, using the Taylor rule, 
as a sort of benchmark, I'll try to say something hopefully sensible about the start of normalization of the actual base policy rate set by the ECB currently at 0% or minus, 0%, minus 0 0.4 if we look at the deposit facility rate. I'll try to indicate if and how the ECB will slow down the pace of the normalization. I feel like it's an academic policy experiment. Each rate relative to the normalization of the macroeconomy. Of course, the scarcity of eligible bonds to buy is another important consideration for the ECB. We produced in my office some nice interest rate profiles. More specifically, in table 6A, this is the value added, if you like, mm -hmm. <laughs> of my speech, <laughs> which assumes a value equal to 2 for the Okun coefficient, is the coefficient that links unemployment and growth rate for the macroeconomies, provides a framework for thinking about the ECB monetary tightening. And then I've got a graph also that shows you the spread between the Taylor rule and the ECB rate. In table 6b, the next table, I give the same story where a different higher Okun coefficient, which is more relevant to the, to the European reality, some labor economists say. So what, what's the punchline here? At the end of 2017, when bond purchases at the current rate will officially end, the policy rate generated by the Taylor rule will be at 1.1%, more than 100 basis points higher than the ECB rate, which is zero. The MRO rate is zero. And 150 basis points higher from the deposit rate. This might suggest, I claim, that early next year would be a reasonable time for the ECB to start tapering. In other words, the Taylor rule, this is just an indication, of course, provides a rationale for tapering early next year. When the ECB ends all asset purchases, middle of next year, the end of next year, I remain agnostic on this, that is the time perhaps when we should look normally and expect the first rate hike to take place. Few general indications can be given by other central banks of the principles that might guide how they would shrink their portfolios. This is country specific at the end. The Bank, the Bank of England, for instance, has stated that it would begin to sell bonds only after it has begun to raise the policy rate. It would work closely with the debt management office to avoid generating unnecessary volatility in the yield market. The FOMC in the United States, at their meeting in June 2011, had laid down some principles for the exit strategy, the Fed exit strategy. One that is relevant to my talk today is that purchases of bonds would stop before the policy rate was increased. Obviously, there are two risks coming from a premature normalization of monetary policy in two minutes, Charles. Mm -hmm. Either in terms of interest rate hikes or in terms of proper tapering. The first, of course, is the risk of a relapse. Namely, the ECB should it abruptly stop loose monetary policy as a result, for instance, of a temporary inflation spike and not supported by the broad economic fundamentals. The second risk is the risk of financial instability once interest rates start to rise. A rate rise could produce major upheavals in European capital markets. A comment also about capital markets now. For instance, in the foreign exchange market, it is not clear at all that ECB tapering, when it happens, whenever it takes place, will be bullish for the euro against the dollar. When the Fed signaled tapering in mid-2013, the dollar strengthened a lot against emerging market currencies, but it weakened against both the euro and the yen, the, the Japanese yen. Aggressive bear steepening and rising fixed income volatility tend to slow down inflows that are not universally beneficial to a currency. At any case, ECB tightening is not that simple. Not only would ECB tightening would steepen curves, but it risks a return of redenomination risk that has been conveniently compressed by ECB's fight against inflation. Take, for instance, the low inflation excuse away and add back the political risk of a French election, French election. And the removal of the QE backstop looks much less positive. 
Of course, talking about exit strategies, one cannot simply be confined to the question of timing. It is a more complicated issue. Central banks effectively fa face a sort of growing maturity mismatch. On the asset side, one can find long-term items like government bonds as a result of the QE program, while on the other side, their liabilities have remained of a very short maturity, typically bank reserves, currency and government deposits. I could give you, and I finish with this, a list of five pending issues to be addressed when we come to the bridge of exit strategies and have to cross it. Five questions, if you like. Question one. Would central banks simply be allowed to leave assets in their balance sheets to mature, which would result, of course, in a gradual normalization of the size of its balance sheet over years? Question two. Are central banks likely to rule out active steps to shrink their balance sheets, which doesn't make sense from a strategic point of view? Question number three. If the central bank needs to sell assets which might incur losses, how might this affect its policy credibility, independence and accountability? Can you, can you imagine front pages in the newspaper said the Bank of England lost hundreds of millions? Should the scaling back question 4 of a central bank's balance sheet be discretionary or rules-based? Should these rules be quantitative-based or price-based? And finally, last but not least, is the issue of financial dominance, namely if the central bank fails to tighten policy when needed because it is anxious about the bond market's reaction. These are all crucial questions to be addressed in due time. I think, Charles, it's time for me to stop here. Thank you for your attention and your patience. Okay.